Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today on this very special 100th episode, I am joined by my brother, Spencer Vanderzee. Spencer, welcome to the show. Hey, what's up, man? Not much. Just uh, here to party and celebrate the the big 100th episode, um, and this is going to be a fun one because um, you are going to be interviewing me because I actually had a listener, Mr. Mark Fullerton, say, hey, you know, People want to know about you. I've done over 100 hours of these shows, and I've, you know, I talk about myself somewhat. I think people know that I'm an audio engineer. I'm a drummer. I have a kid. I hurt my ankle <laughs> sort of recently, but um, it right. might be fun just to dig in a little bit more and um, and do it. So before we do that, I should say that you obviously are a bass player, right? Oh, yeah, for many years with you, obviously. We've been in many bands together. Yep, and we... Um, Obviously, growing up, we played music all the time, and I couldn't think of anyone better to um, interview me than, you know, my own brother, who I've played with a lot. Thanks, Bart. So we've had like months. We've had 100 episodes to do this, but because of the way we are, we've waited until you are on vacation right now at the Grand Canyon, staying in like a cool tent thing. Um, Yeah, I'm recording this from a tent right now. So if you guys hear canvas slapping or anything, I'm sorry about that, but it's cool here in the Grand Canyon. That's good. Um, you know, we'll excuse some canvas flapping. Um, so, yeah, why don't we just uh, kick it off and you can just kind of ask some of the simple questions about me and then I'll answer them um, and be on the other side of, uh, you know, the microphone here. So fire away. All right. Well, first of all, what's wrong with you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, what is uh, I know you've been playing the drums, obviously, since you were tiny. You actually started when you were like five i didn't get a bass till i was 11 or 12 or something but tell me about um and the guests uh, the listeners rather about how you started the drums and uh what that was like for you yeah so um when i was a little kid um our grandpa tom conop uh rest in peace was a drummer um growing up i think in you know upstate new york uh, closer to the city, I guess he would come in and out of the city, I think, but he was a drummer. So anyway, when we were kids, he would always, uh, and an artist, which you yourself, I should have said before are uh, a great, you know, artist, not. Yeah. That's my, that's my main gig is I'm an, I'm an artist and pop who was uh, an artist and a drummer was a huge influence to both of us. Yeah. So he would draw, um, things like outlines of things that we would color in. So like a tank, race cars, like indie cars, which he loved. Um, but he would draw drums and I remember coloring them in and, um, that always kind of stuck with me. And I've just always felt this, like, like many drummers listening right now, you just have this, like you're it's, you know, primordial. You're like drawn to the drums. Um, so anyway, we were, uh, on vacation, when we were really little in Florida and I got sick, I had the rotovirus, which, you know, I've never really Googled it. I think it's pretty serious. Basically it's like a stomach thing. And I was in the hospital and it was terrible. And it was like, you know, one of those things where it got to the point of like, your parents are like, what can we do to make you feel better? And, um, I think I said, I want a drum set. Um, which I think if my kid at any point said, I just bought a drum set for Harry for a hundred bucks off, uh, Facebook marketplace. But, they probably would have bought it anyway. But anyway, I was right. sick. Got a drum set, got a percussion plus drum set. It was a kick, a snare, a tom, no floor tom, and no hi hat, which I always was like, why didn't I have a hi hat? I didn't have a hi hat for years. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird. Yeah, it's not fair. But um, then uh, one little symbol that came out of the bass drum on a little arm. Um, so. Uh, yeah, had that again, I was like five or six, um, which, you know, when you're that young, it's just the whole goal is just to be around the drums and play them. Um, went to a music, went to a drum teacher, uh, Elmer Monk when I was really little. Uh, oh yeah. I remember. That. Yeah. At Macon music. And then fast forward, like, you know, when I was 11 or 12 or something, I actually started going to lessons to him. Uh, but at making can, music, that's that's where you saw uh, didn't like Carmine a piece do a uh, he did yeah clinic when I was a kid yeah yeah that was cool yeah that was cool so um, Elmer was there and he was a great teacher I remember he was like trying out to be in Slayer uh, at one point which was really cool. after yeah. like they left before they got 
Paul, I guess. Yeah, this was years ago. Um, but so I, I took lessons there as a kid for a long time. I want to say four or five years, which I guess I guess that counts as a long time. Um, but uh, we would do like, you know, group lessons where you're you, he had like an old school projector and we would play on pads and it would be on the wall and uh, had a really good book, which um, now that I look back on it, the book was very much like uh Ted Reed's syncopation, which Spencer, that's a drum. That's like a classic drum book. Um, but it was very much that kind of like, you know, uh, big, thick, like you can almost, it almost looks like a Sharpie, uh, which people who know syncopation know what I'm talking about, where it's kind of a thicker line. It's very easy to read. But anyway, so we did that. Um, simultaneously, I was playing in bands with my friend, Bill, uh, Bain, who Spencer, you know, very well. Um, you do. And, uh, we were doing that. We were playing, um, I played in the high school band challenge, which when we were, you know, younger here in Cincinnati was a very big deal. I actually won it with a band when Bill and I were in eighth grade and two other guys were seniors in high school. We played with them and, uh, pissed people off cause we were so young, <laughs> but, um, that was fun. You and I did it. We did it for three years. You and I did it together. Uh, you were in a band with me. We, that was like the first well, we played together for a long time just at home. Yeah, but- we'd always been like jamming and stuff, but never really committed to like a, an official project. We spent more time coming up with like horrible, funny names than actually like <laughs> writing songs and albums yeah. and stuff. Yeah, exactly. So um, just like, um, uh, you know, we did the band challenge stuff, went through high school, and then I got to the time of college. Well, let me back up and say that... Um, You know, so this uh, this episode is basically about my life. So I'm just going to go into detail here. So basically when I was uh, this is kind of cool because it was like a garage sale kind of changed my life in a way because I think I was in about sixth or seventh grade and our, our mom, Carrie, loves garage sales and stuff like that. So I think we do, too. But um, anyway, we were I was walking by a garage. So there was a little box. And it said Yamaha and it was, you know, clearly some music stuff, but it ended up being, and I forget what the the number is, MX 100, something like that. It's a little four track cassette. Oh yeah. That thing, the blue, the little blue thing or the black one? It's black. It's black. Yeah. And it, uh, was a four track recorder that, um, only had line in, it didn't actually have any XLR inputs. So at that point we would use like an XLR to, quarter inch converter and didn't really understand, you know, the difference between anything. Um, Were we at bouncing tracks down at that point? Okay. So that's the funny thing is, is we would record on that. You and I would, we would have friends who were guitarists playing. I would jam with, uh, you know, some guys who were, because you're four years older than me. I should probably say that, but guys who are my age. Um, But what it would do is the technology would record at a much higher speed and then you mm-hmm. would bounce it out. You were you would technically supposed to be run. Let's call them like RCA cables, like white and red audio cables out into a tape deck that would then be playing it back at, I guess, a normal speed. So when I was what, like 11, I don't know how old you, you are when you're in sixth grade, like 11 or 12. No I one knows. No one knows. I didn't know anything about that. So literally the only way I could we could play that stuff back was out of the machine. Um, so we could literally never take a cassette out and like put it in or convert it to a CD or whatever. Cause this was like, I mean, that would have been like 2000, right. 2001. So it's not like this was, I mean, cassettes were still around, I guess, but it was very much CD uh, era. But anyway, so um, simultaneously with drumming, I was also very into recording um, you and I, and our bands and stuff uh then you know i upgraded i bought a korg d3200 which i think i saved up and paid like i would say 1200 or 1500 dollars for this thing um and it was a because i had a job i mean we'd always have jobs but it was like it was an all-in-one little korg it was like the end of the era of like porta studios like You know, everything in one, a CD burner, a little flip up display, Um, right? The little like not a trackpad, but like a little like a like a teeny little thumb joystick. Yeah, exactly. And we would use the hell out of that thing. I mean, we used it all the time. Those are awesome recordings. 
Yeah, it was really cool. Um, but anyway, so that was, but like simultaneously in 2005, when I got that, 2004, really people started using laptops and recording, home recording. Um, so anyway, it was kind of like, all right, well, I should have just bought a different computer. Um, yeah, so always been doing recording playing the drums longer. Um, I got to, you know, fast forwarding back to where we were before I got to college and I was going to the, uh, electronic media, the electronic media program here at CCM. And I chose that, which is the college conservatory of music at UC. I chose that because I could either go for drums or go for recording. And, um, you know, I've said it before on on another podcast, and I don't think it's like offensive to anyone, but I personally thought I would have better luck making a career doing audio stuff and video stuff. Maybe. Yeah. Well, it's a lot more practical. I mean, like to make money of it sucks. To, you have to think of it that way, but yeah, yeah, that's the way it is, which I think it takes a lot of guts and courage and uh when people you know they're like, like nothing ventured nothing gained where if people do make it work as a successful drummer to support your family or at least yourself then oh yeah incredible then you did it but for me again i um i loved audio engineering though and and i liked video um so well actually i didn't have any interest in video whatsoever went to school realized i actually liked it um but yeah, what what got you started in the video? Was that me, like music videos or what was some of the first video things you got into? So it was through school. It would be um, uh, it would be I kind of realized that um, it would be a lot like audio editing, because at that point in college, I was using a computer setup. I was using Cubase um, for audio people. That's just like a digital audio workstation similar to Pro Tools or Logic. But it basically came free with a interface that I bought. But um, I realized video was a lot like uh, audio. It's just a timeline based thing. Um, and I honestly, it sounds kind of bad saying it out loud, but I realized that there was also a way to support yourself doing video. On top of the audio thing, there was more money to be made in video because, like, right. every business needs a little video. So, you know, everyone, th there always needs to be a, vi there's more like companies that need a video guy than need an audio guy. Sure. Um, per se. So I did, you know, in, in school, I'll just kind of blow through this, but we did like, you do everything from like, you know, a news anchor class where you're the camera guy and there's news anchors. And a lot of those people actually went on to be like successful news anchors in like all the different markets. Like this program has people, there are so many movies and TV shows and people on like i said the news uh, yeah my wife did the same major and she went interned at cnn completely different tract you know yeah and now she's a lawyer who knows how to barely turn on the tv um <laughs> that's true so She'll no she would she would agree with that but uh, i'm just kidding but um so you get to try everything um i also did a lot of like i i dabbled in after effects and like making backgrounds for like a local for like a a, a school opera like there'd be a lot of opera students. A lot of these people go on to be like on Broadway. So we would do hmm. the backgrounds. Didn't really like after effects um, stuff. Uh, but so always playing the drums um, was playing in a band at that point called the sound museum. Um, I was teaching the drums. I should probably say that too. I was working as a drum teacher from about when I was 16 until into my, I threw college and I would make, you know, pretty decent money. I was working at uh, Sam Ash. I was working at the Drum Center of Cincinnati, um, which closed sadly. And then I was doing private, where I would Saturdays and Sundays drive and teach a bunch of people. And I, I would say that after doing this show, I have learned that you know you get your like Mike Johnstons or these people who are like just ultra mega teachers. And it made me kind of think like, God, I was like not that. Like I stopped going to lessons at a certain time and I feel like I didn't keep up with my reading, but I could play, I can play pretty well. I'll say that. I think I'm a pretty good drummer, but like one thing that I think I specialized in with lessons was making kids and young adults or whatever, you know, however old they are, have fun and enjoy playing and like be really pumped about 
how awesome the drums are. Yeah, definitely. It's almost like, I don't know, like the culture of the drums or something, which isn't to say you're not like an incredibly good drummer. I mean, I've, we've been playing together for so long, but there's that certain ceiling of like, I'll never be Jaco. Maybe you'll never be Marco Miniman or something like that, but it doesn't matter. You can teach what you have. And I mean, hell, you have, you had like 10 or 15 or 20 students at one point, didn't you? Yeah. And it would be, um, you know, again, being in college, not really able to have another job during the year, but you'd you bring in like 1200 bucks or something a month yeah. just from teaching drums. So it was, you know, which, what do you, now that you look back, I have a kid. I'm like, what was I, what was I buying? Like buying beer, buying like food, like mm-hmm. y- your life mm-hmm. is so different then. But, um, yeah. So, uh, went through college, was doing that, uh, was teaching, was playing, um, was doing the recording. Yeah, you were, so you were a lot back then too, right? Yeah. We would do gigs. You know, that's the thing that I, I want, you know, I don't know if I've ever talked about it on the show really, but like, so we've, you and I have both played a ton of shows around, um, you know, Cincinnati and I guess a little bit further out, but I personally have never, cause people always ask me like, are you going to go on tour? Are you playing in a band? I've never been in a band that's like really been a big touring band that's been successful. And like, like our bands have done well locally and we've had a lot of fun, but, um, yeah, and mi- minimal touring, like more like weekend shows and stuff, but it's, it's hard yeah. to do, man. It is. And I'm, I'm now, you know, fortunate where I've met a lot of these people where their lives are on the road and they're like, you know, amazing drummers who are literally living the dream of, I think most drummers, but yeah, I just never did that. So I guess that answers that question of like, you know, so yeah, no, I've never really been a big touring drummer, but I would say, and my, usually my answer to that is, but I've had more, like, I've had probably more successful, like outside of the podcast things happen to me in the media or like kind of like quote unquote cool stuff world as an audio engineer than I have as like a drummer. I've done a fa- well, let me back up. So I went to school when I was a junior. I interned um, at a recording studio called Sound Images, which became Gwyn Sound uh, years later, which most people I think listen to the show know that that's where I've worked Um for a long time. That's where you record the podcast, right? Typically. Uh, I've been recording at home since COVID. Um, oh yeah. Okay, cool. So, but yeah, the first 60 or 55 episodes are at Gwyn in the booth there. And it'll say, this is a Gwyn sound podcast and all that. And, and I'm, you know, I'm working there all the time. I do work when we get done with this, I have to do work for them. Um, and we'll talk about that more later, but so junior year, interned immediate click with all of them day one of being there bootsy collins was there and we were recording him for some promo for the grammys so it was like whoa this is which for people who don't know bootsy lives in cincinnati um yeah he's the best we we love bootsy and is from I here go get yeah. bootsy impression but i'm not gonna do it right now all right maybe at the end well you you <laughs> you, you you have to do it now go ahead and do it oh, man, oh bubble. <laughs> Okay, good. So you got that out. <laughs> so interned there. Uh, I think when I was interning, started doing, um, uh, I would start doing some drumming there on sessions. So that's where I've had the opportunity to do over the years. A lot of session work is at Gwyn Sound, um, formerly Sound Images. So that is some cool stuff that I've done where uh, playing on like some jingles um, a lot of corporate stuff, a lot of people where they're like, oh, I don't have a drummer. And then they just kind of called me down from the, the hall and I would play on it. Um, you played on a couple like toys, didn't you? Like you'd push the button and the, the, the toy, yeah. the sound that would yeah, come I out. I forgot about that. So, uh, Weird backing up, I mean, if you go way back, Cincinnati was Kenner toys. So sound images when that was this name of the studio in the eighties would make a lot of like, like we had this little board that has like one inch, one you know, one and a quarter, one and a half inch speakers that you would then plug in and you could test all the different sounds for the, um, toys. So what I think the key thing that I learned with all of this, with, with interning there is yes, drumming is awesome, but I also really, really, really loved the engineering stuff. And then what I learned further is, and I learned this more over the years is like, I love recording bands and music but I mainly like recording my own bands a lot more than I like recording other people's music. And on top of that, I like recording like voices and radio spots and audiobooks. 
a lot more than I do recording. Um, I love recording music on Saturday. I'm doing an eight hour session recording vocalists, but like, I really like doing, uh, audio stuff. So I think if anyone out there is like interested in audio, you really don't need to only do like tracking vocals and guitar and drums. Um, and I love doing that stuff again, but I really like doing recording myself musically, not as much spending a month recording someone else's album and then they end up like sitting on it and doing nothing with it um yeah that's a very different type of uh producer engineer yeah so um i had the opportunity to learn that and do that and then um uh yeah so i got out of school um in 2013 um i had a rented a music space and kind of started a quote-unquote business which literally was you spencer Bill, who I mentioned earlier, right. and his girlfriend Alyssa, and we would we were we were voodoo. Fa- we were in an old warehouse, and um, we would uh, do videos for people, and we would do stuff like that. It was never, I mean, in in no way, shape, or form could you support like an actual life with that. It was kind of like uh, end of school before you get a real job, kind of like thing. But we could like a creative endeavor. Yeah, kind we of. made it work though for a little bit. Um, yeah. Awesome. So, um, yeah, that was that, uh, fast forward. I did video. Um, I don't, I'm now giving like my entire life story, but I feel like it kind of all ties together with who I am and, uh, and all this stuff, but I'll, I'll speed up a little bit. So I, I did video for a company for like two years where they paid me to do video and be in my own studio, like 25 minutes away from the actual company. So I was just, it was kind of a crazy dream job. Um, I'm still playing the drums, still doing all this stuff. Um, but uh, then you and I, so I, I forget the actual year here, Spence, but you and I played in a band called Talk. When did Talk start? Like five years ago, probably. Yeah. So um, we were playing in a band and everything's cool uh, and performing out a lot. Um, and then simultaneously, I got a, uh, oh, well, I should back up. I was, I was working a gig called um songs for seeds so what songs for seeds was was this was like a every day no i would say three times a week and then some weekend parties uh it was like music classes for kids um but not like okay here's a you know a c on a guitar and here's a g it was like for zero to six year olds and it would be like now we go to the animal wheel and you spin it Right, the cleanup, cleanup song, song or whatever. Yeah, and you filled in on some some gigs, and I did. It was fun, but I'm not really like an incredible drummer. It was cool. I remember at one point the uh, singer looked back because I had no training with them, and he was like, "Hit me with the Bo Diddley beat," and I'm like, "Oh my god, the <laughs> Bo Diddley beat!" And you know, it was really that like I want candy beat, dunk, 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 dunk. But like, yeah, I was flying by the seat of my pants no. on that one. Where were you? Uh, I don't know. I had to. I think I had to do another <laughs> video job or something or, or, or an audio job, but um. So we did that for like two years. It was awesome. You would play these gigs. I think if you technically count a class as a show, which, you know, Mm. like, you know, your nine o'clock would be a show and then your 10 o'clock would be a show. We did like 300 shows in a year. Um, But that's kind of a stretch. That's not like you're playing Madison Square Garden every night. No. Are you like comparing yourselves to Pink Floyd or something? (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) Um, <laughs> okay. so, uh, did that. And then I became full time, um, at Gwyn sound, which at that point was sound images. It's kind of confusing, but the original owner was there. So, um, and that's when I started to kind of do, um, I got into more of the, which I would, you know, people have heard me talk about it before, but it's kind of worth mentioning here. Um, once I started working there more full time, I kind of got more into like, you know, you get more responsibility. And that's when I got the opportunity to do more of the like, uh, it's such a weird niche thing, but I did a fair amount of the ADR or dialogue replacement uh, for movies and TV shows, which, hmm. you know, so to explain what that is, is uh And again, it falls into that category of like, you don't have to be recording, you know, violinists and drummers and guitarists all the time. There's a lot of audio that needs to be recorded. But so what ADR is, is it's 
I think it's called automatic or automated dialogue replacement. Don't really get that name because it's not automatic uh, because you have to do it yourself. They call it looping too. But um, what it does is every time you see a movie or a TV show, sometimes it's more obvious than others because it wasn't really laid in right. But um, it's fixing lines that got messed up in the recording process. Right. I mean, it's so can I ask you a quick question? I watched um, Jackie Chan's first strike the other night and it was overdubbed, but like with English, like it looked like everybody was speaking English, but then they put English over it. That's, that's ADR. So, um, so the, like you're saying that it would have been filmed and recorded in, you know, uh, in Chinese. Right. And then they, no, it looked like it was filmed in English and then they put English subtitle or English language over it. it. It was like unnaturally like, uh, yeah, it was weird. It remind it just reminded me of like an unnecessary ADR thing. Well, that might have been a mixing thing too, where like they have the 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 vocal tr- like the dialogue track and um but yeah, I've seen that where it's like it looks like their move their mouths are moving, but a lot of times maybe it tricked you because I've worked on one where they'll literally write the dialogue to match the lip movement of the other language to make it as close as humanly possible to um to make it seem like that. But all right, so Huh. One thing that should be clear, though, is in um, ADR. So I should say that it's dialogue for movies and TV shows because I've done ADR. I've done animated dialogue because if you're doing dialogue recording for an animated film, that's not ADR because you're not replacing it. You're actually recording the like, you know, the character speaking. Um so that's a different thing. So, and which, which I've had the opportunity to do as well, which is cool. But, um, yeah, so what happens is, and it's kind of, and I'll say some of the stuff I've done, cause I think it's kind of cool, but, um, people, the actor, you might be thinking you live in Cincinnati, you don't live in LA or New York or wherever or Atlanta. Why are you, why is this happening here? Um, we have a relatively good film industry here. I would say we do have a good film industry here where there's a big tax credit, which that kind of usually is why people come in, but um, to do that, because they get money off their movie. And what happens is, is so for the first big, for the first big one I did was uh, that I actually just assisted on, but I ended up doing a fair amount of like, you know, the button pushing was uh, fantastic beasts and where to find them. What? So that was Mm -hmm. Colin Farrell. So he was here in Cincinnati filming killing of a sacred deer. Um, Oh, I love that. I sh- movie. Really I never creepy. saw it, but, um, no, well, it's so creepy. I love okay. It. I need to see it. But anyway, so the actor will be here filming movie a, which is currently in production and then movie B, which is totally finished filming, totally wrapped. They're then working on the post-production and they're fixing these lines. Um, right. So that's how it works. And they would, that's not just here. That's in any given major oh, yeah. city. They would be you know, filming in, they find a studio and they're doing the same, same Everywhere. deal. A lot of the ones I've done cool. are there's people here who are doing like the Shakespeare company's performance of blah. And because that this actor who was like a background actor um, is here. And, and a lot of the times, I mean, I, I I'll be honest, I've done a fair amount of big movies, but a lot of times they're, background characters colin farrell was one of the bigger ones um who was a main character but a lot of times they are either a background character or someone um who's like you know not that huge of a um a player in it but um just looking at i'm kind of looking i have an imdb page which if anyone googles my name and imdb you can see but i'm just going to kind of say a few of them um So like Dolly Parton's Heartstrings on Netflix, uh, Dark Waters, that was a movie on Netflix that was filmed in Cincinnati. I did a ton on that. Um, The Deuce, which was on HBO with Maggie Gyllenhaal and uh, uh, oh, James Franco. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So did that, which that one was cool because I actually really I watched that show like from the beginning and then I got to work on the series finale, the very last episode. Um, Which was cool, but like um, Chicago PD, Law and Order, those were cool. Um, Arrested Development. um, And then you get the like animated ones. So I worked on uh, the girl who played, who was in Frozen, is from Cincinnati, the young girl. So I worked on Olaf's Frozen Adventure. Um, 
I did a lot of voiceover or did the narrator for um, the first 48. Uh, I worked on the Trolls movie, the last one. Um, and like that would be considered dialogue um, for an animated thing. But did a fair amount of that. That's kind of the when people are like, oh, have you been a touring drummer? I go, no, but I've done some cool stuff with like movies because I feel the need to like justify <laughs> my existence. Your existence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Um, then currently uh, that kind of brings us up to now. I mean, I still work with Gwen since COVID. I've been working from home more and kind of like splitting the time with watching Harry, who's my son. And then I work mainly at night from Gwen and uh, Abby, who's my wife. As you know, Spencer, she'll she'll uh, work from home half the time and then we'll we'll split it with that. Um, but uh, yeah, so still doing session work at Gwyn. Um, I've done a lot of them recently when I hurt my ankle, um, which was from skateboarding. Uh, completely. You're not very good. <laughs> I was OK, but it just not anymore. It ruptured my Achilles tendon um, and. Then once that healed, though, I've been back doing it into sessions. But, um, you know, as a drummer, I've always it's kind of like these weird things where, again, recording, I like doing the voice drumming. Sounds crazy. And I'm sure other people like this, too. But I've always wanted to be on really popular, big, famous jingles, you know, like um, O'Reilly Automotive, you know, like. I always think, man, I wish I yeah, it's not a local one. People know what know, that is, but it plays probably regionally, but it plays on the radio all the time. So like, um, right. You know, I, th- we have all the fun. Didn't you I do played something on, on the that Watsons one? The commercials. Watson. That's right. Uh, I played on champion windows, which is in 48 different cities. Um, Joseph, Sh- you get like, you don't get royalties for these like session drummers, a session musician would go in, you get cut a check and then that's, that's I mean, the gig. Right? Maybe other people have better deals than me if they're like union. But for me, it was literally like some of those would be like, you know, I get $50 or a hundred dollars cause it's 50 bucks an hour. Um, and like a coupon for 50 bucks off a pool table or a hot <laughs> not, tub. Not even that, um, Man. but it, it's cool. You get to hear yourself all the time. And, um, you know, like you're watching TV or like you're at the dentist and you're kind of like, Oh, you know, I played drums on that. You get to say that, but <laughs> okay, if that, but yeah, okay. that's, that's, that's my payment. Um, <laughs> right. So, uh, that's pretty much, oh, let me back up to actually, I should probably say when I started the podcast. Um, yeah. So I was just going to ask like, when did, what was the first iteration of it before you started the podcast? What were you thinking? I mean, I know you, you and I have both been interested, not just in, the instruments that we play, but the history of them, the the culture and stuff. Um, and as you said, our grandpa pop got us so interested in like percussion and drums and rhythm and stuff so long ago. When did you start considering starting this podcast? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, in 20, I don't know, I started the podcast in 2018. So I would say in like 2016, I had like never really, or 2015, 16, I'd never really even listened to a podcast at all. And they, they'd been around for 10 years or so at that point, I think. But, um, so I was recording other people's shows at work, primarily filmmakers drinking bourbon was the podcast I, oh, yeah. I recorded a hundred plus episodes of. And finally I was like, okay, I need to start listening to podcasts. Uh, and of course I love it and I do it. I listen to them all the time now and uh, I'm sure you, I know you do too. And people who are listening to this, you're, you're literally listening to a podcast right now. So obviously you do too. But um, so uh, we were playing in a band, the band kind of like came to an end as bands do, especially when you're in a band with your brother and two friends were like, you know, and you, you know what I'm talking about where you kind of hit a point where like productivity sort of turns more into like, drinking beer and playing video games and playing music a little bit. Like we have a show coming up. Let's play the set. Okay. now let's hang out, which was, there was a little bit of chill. Yeah. That's an interesting way of saying it. Some, I mean, projects tend to have kind of an arc and obviously Gordy and Brian are, you know, we'll play with them again soon. And, but yeah, projects always have kind of an arc. So our arc came, you know, crashing down into the ground and we just broke, broke up basically, (laughs) or we just kind of like, we'll pick it up later. 
which is never going to happen. Bit of a fizzle. Yeah. <laughs> just like, well, it just stopped. So <laughs> I guess fast forward a little bit. Um, I thought to myself, uh, it was a mix of, I was watching videos on about the Chicago drum show, which is coming up this weekend, actually, as I'm recording this. Um, and I was like, oh, are you going? I am going. I'm going on. I'll be there Sunday. But th- this will be out two days after it's over. But um, okay. yeah, so I'll be there. But um, uh, yeah, I, I was watching these shows and I was like, oh, man, I love the drums. So I, I really wanted to start a podcast. And it was kind of one of those things where people say, like, I wanted to start a business and I didn't really have the idea for the business yet. But that's really what it was like, where I was like, OK, I want to do a podcast. It's obviously going to be some sort of drum related thing. I was listening to drum gab at that point now drumio gab a lot with Seamus I was listening to the modern drummer podcast with Mike and Mike all the time um and uh I kind of thought all right I want it to be drum related and I was like I need to do something I want to learn more about the history of the drums was kind of the progression of it in my mind and I'm kind of like how do you do it I'm, and it just was like all right well maybe if I do it on the podcast and I interview people or it was going to be I'm going to research a ton of different stuff and I'm going to present episodes again, emphasis on I am going to do an episode about the history of Ludwig. And so like initially your plan was just, you would research it and then you would talk about it. Yes. And, um, and I was like, I actually, uh, reached out to our uncle William and who's a great historian right. stuff. And I was like, can you do some of the research and help me? And then it started to turn into, and William's busy. He has a job, uh, like waiting on, you know, okay, we got to do this. And then I realized, what am I doing? I'm an idiot. There's experts out there who know this stuff. I can't ever possibly know everything, which I've really learned from doing the podcast. Like there's, it, it was just a, it, it's the natural progression of things. So you go, I can do it. No, wait, let me interview experts on it. Let me find these people because that's and of course, it's like, duh, you idiot. That's what a podcast is, is you interview people. No one wants to listen. Otherwise, it's just an audio book, basically. Um, no, no one wants to hear you. T- do that at all. <laughs> no, but um, so here's a fun bit of like information um, for the drummers out there. I don't know if you're familiar with them, Spencer, probably not. But uh, I actually somehow got connected with early on. Again, this is three years ago with uh, Tim Baltus, who's Timbo from Kino, which most I, I have talked to that guy. I'm yeah, I know exactly who yeah. that guy is. I Tim's love that awesome. Guy. Very nice guy. We've hung out yeah. in person at PASIC and stuff, but, um, so Tim is great. And I realized at that point I was like, so, you know, it had not even started yet. This is like April of 2018 when I first started recording, you know, or, or I just had the idea. So I didn't even have a name, have a name yet, but I told, I, I got on the phone with Tim he probably doesn't even remember this, um, but I got, we somehow got on the phone talking. I don't really even know. I guess I just reached out to him. And uh, anyway, I said, I, I was like, would you want to co-host it with me? And hmm. which I think I did that. And maybe, you know, it's a thing I do where like I'd have a tendency to think someone else who's like bigger than me. Like at that point, he was, you know, he had like. 5,000 face Instagram followers, which now he has a ton more, but like, it was like, Oh, this guy's doing it. You know, I, yeah. need, I can't do it on my own. I need his help, which, you know, whatever psychology you want to put into that. But, um, weak. I'm weak. I'm just, no, <laughs> I don't know. So self, self doubt. If you're about to start a huge project like that, I completely understand. It's intimidating. Yeah. So anyway, I said to Tim, I was like, do you want to help out? And I think, you know, honestly, I think my phone kept breaking up and I remember I couldn't really hear what he was saying, <laughs> which is kind of funny, but right. uh, it basically came to no, you should do it on your own. And I was like, I can't hear you. My phone is breaking up. <laughs> um, he, though, I think directed me to get to the right people of like, you know, you should talk to uh, Joe Meckler, who was on one of the first episodes about World War II drums. And I think I'm, I don't even know. I think he, that led to a snowball of like, you know, just putting me in the right people within the community. Um, so, uh, boy, it would have been a different show if, if, uh, I love Tim, but if he, if, if we were doing it together, it would have been a completely different, uh, thing. It's just interesting to think about that. Cause he's, he's like a character. It, it is. 
He is. And like the coolest thing I think about your podcast is that so many podcasts that I, I listen to are a couple guys or a group of comedians. And so much of it is about riffing. And I, I know I'm kind of like, you know, we're, we're having fun and stuff, but like yours is pretty just facts and it's about the information. It's not trying to be anything. It isn't. You're not trying to be a comedian or anything like that. Yeah. It's, it's a nice refreshing point of view in my opinion. Okay. Well, I am trying to be a comedian, but I guess it's failing completely. Um, Absolutely. No, I always say that I want it to be like an NPR podcast or like a Ken Burns documentary of a podcast version that's not six hours long. But um, so, yeah, long winded answer is then I, you know, I kind of it all fell into place of like, yeah, I want to do the history of the drums. And then I did, um, uh, you know, recorded these episodes and then I, I recorded like three. I recorded three episodes. I did. Uh, silent movie drummers with Kelly Ray Tubbs. I did World War II drums with um, uh, with Joe Meckler, Joey Boom, and then I did um, uh, the history of Slingerland. What I thought was the history of Slingerland with um, oh, hold on, Jim. I did the history of Slingerland with Jim Moritz, uh, which it's that kind of taught me a lesson too. Of I I went to Jim to do the history of Slingerland, and it turned into be a completely different episode about how his family. Hmm worked at Slingerland. So that was an early lesson of like, I got to be clear to people what I want because I loved how his episode turned out. But if you want someone to do the history of a company, you need to be clear and say, this is what I'm looking for. Otherwise, Jim pulled it off. Great. But you need to be clear because I've had some where people are like, we do it and they go, oh, I don't know. You should have talked to this guy. (laughs) Like, oh, okay. Yeah. So I I don't mean to digress too much from that. But like, yeah, how often how do you give people talking points about what you want them to talk about. I mean, you basically have, we we're just kind of having a nice conversation right now. And we obviously we talk and play music all the time together, but like somebody you don't know, an expert, do you give them bullet points that you want to make sure they touch on? So, um, no. And, and that's the, uh, the interest, the, the process of it is, and now there's a lot of people who, well, to touch on, to finish that up, th- that thing up before is I recorded the episodes I waited until October from April to October before I released because I I couldn't find I I was like, I got to record the intro. I got to do the drums. I got to do the drums. And then I ended up not even doing it. That's the that that, 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 is some stock thing that I found on a music licensing service we have through work, which people are like Hmm. disappointed when they hear that. But again, it was one of those things where (laughs) I was like. It it was like it was seriously stopping the show from being launched because I just never found the time to do it. But. So the process, though, is I usually think of a topic, which now most of them are a lot of them are submitted, like people to send me tons of great ideas, but um, they submit an idea um, or or I say, OK, let's so I want to do um, the history of Gretsch drums, which was with John Sheridan super early on. So so yeah. I find him and I say or, or like, like, let's say I just Google history of Gretsch or I do whatever. Uh, it turns out he wrote a book on it. Great. Or Rob Cook, who's, you know, the Chicago drum show founder, he recommends him to me. A lot of people have been recommended by Rob. But um, so I don't give any bullet points. I just say uh, I want you to do a chronological history of this brand, this thing, this technique, this style, this teacher. I always just say just simplify it and go in chronological order. And um that's basically it. And to be honest, it's easier on me. There are times though, where like, you know, I do prepare stuff where like the Zildjian episode with, which people really liked with Paul Francis, I I had written seven pages on Zildjian because originally the first episode of this podcast, uh, which I didn't even mention this before. I recorded an hour long history of Zildjian myself and I never really, I remember You got so into that. I remember doing uh, illustrations of like Avedis Zildjian and stuff, making illust- uh, making symbols yeah. and everything. And yeah, you were like Zildjian obsessed for a while. Yeah. And uh, but then again, I just I pivoted. But so with the Zildjian episode, I had pre, you know, written down information about like there was a assassination attempt in, you know, 17 whatever. And in most episodes, though, I rely on uh, the guests to be knowledgeable and then myself to just direct it and keep the conversation going and um 
some of them are pretty dry topics. Some of them, which you kind of have to make more fun, which I think they all turn out great, but some of them are really interesting and fun guests who have done like impressions of people and uh, with like your, yeah, yourself with boots, <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I think that answers your question of just, no, keeping it on track, and then they record. As we're recording, like literally right now, I have Pro Tools running. I drop markers as I go, or I say, cut out Spencer's stupid Bootsy impression, and um, no, I'm kidding. No, you're going to I know. And then, uh, so then I go back and reverse time, so I go back to front, and I make my edits, because otherwise, if you go front to back, you make one cut, and then... The time is all off because you're literally altering the time you're sucking in and the, the markers don't move correctly. But um, hmm. then I listen back one time and make one round of edits. And then I usually am right against the clock and I publish it at like 1155 on Monday night when it's due to be out on Tuesday. And um, you d- I will say you work extremely weird hours you always have like you work all night and like you know if we're ever traveling together or something inevitably you and i are the ones up at the end of the night and uh looking through like drum videos and stuff like that to post at like you know 10 30 11 and you're like oh my god i have to get something yeah. out but your consistency has been very impressive i mean it's that's kind of what it's all about especially with the social medias you're always posting something cool that other people don't post well thanks and uh you know it's kind of funny because like, you know, there was like maybe a brief period in my life where I'd be like, you know, into going to the gym or something. And I'm talking like a week. When was that? <laughs> There's like, <laughs> like, what are you talking about? <laughs> my gym phase. No, I'm saying it's very brief. I do like to, I did before I hurt my ankle. Yeah. I did like to run. So mm-hmm. like I would go like in my mind, like y- you in people who do anything like like you have to practice, like you set yourself up where like you can't miss a day. Otherwise, it's right. like the end of the world. Instead of like a healthy thing, though, mine has become posting a drum video every single day at like midnight um, has become right. my like, you know, I have to do it kind of thing. Um, but yeah, social media has become a um, I mean, I don't think a fraction of the people would have heard of the podcast uh, drum history, obviously, without me being simultaneously, you know, a page on social media, on Instagram, particularly where people, uh, like what I post and they see those videos and, uh, enjoy it. But it's, there's no easy, it's not, these videos take a bunch of time to find. So I'm glad people like it because it's, it's, it's work for sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, uh, the Instagram thing. It's like, it's almost its own audience. Cause I have Instagram pages that I follow that post all sort of cool, world music and instruments and stuff. And like, it might be podcasts or not. I don't know, but it's just interesting that you're providing this different media experience for different people, you know? Yeah. And I tell people too, cause again, you know, a big part of my job is recording other people's podcasts and they'll say, how do I, what do I use social media for? How do I do it? And I have to be careful because usually all they've done, I, I say to them, you don't just want to post a picture of you with the guest once a week saying a new episode is out. Like, you can do that. There's absolutely right. nothing wrong with that. You'll do fine. Everything's great, but like not that many people want to follow it. So I treat the Instagram, which is literally the exact same thing as Facebook. It posts to both places as mm-hmm. a standalone like business, quote unquote business. Well, like, how do you decide what you're going to post though? I mean, in a world of a gajillion awesome drummers, fascinating stuff, dudes playing the tabla in india or the udu or a djembe or something like what what are you looking for on a given night what what do you search for uh well i mean so really there's no rhyme or reason um like uh do you follow this like suggestions mostly or you just get like an, an inkling and try and dig yeah deeper? no none of, uh, no, i shouldn't say none but i would say like one percent of the instagram videos are like someone in brazil will say check out this great drummer i think you'll like him you you should post this i'll go great cool thanks and i love it because i'm like yes i don't have to look for a video tonight but um so it is literally like i'll search uh and there are some like i don't want to say secrets but like there's some stuff where like that i do where i'm like i don't really want to tell people because it's it it's a tricky you got your your system but Really, though, it's like like last night I posted a drummer from Senegal. So like you type in 
Senegal master drummer, or you change different keywords. And right. and honestly, you, where you say there's so many videos out there, yes, there are, but like, I'm going to be doing this for a long time. I have no signs of stopping. So the first cool one I find, I download, which even the downloading process and the getting it framed right for Instagram and this is kind of a thing. But um, yeah, there's I think I've missed three days or four days in three years uh, where I didn't post every day. Or two. You can make up two and a half years. Yeah. Um, Like even literally being in the hospital after Harry was born. And I'm like, you know, even if the Wi-Fi is not strong enough, like we were at a cabin, you and I and our wives and kids were at a cabin recently. And it's like, okay, I have enough Wi-Fi to like post like a catalog picture and be like, what's your what's your favorite rap finish? That's just because I don't have enough strength to like download a full video. Um, But it's it's consistency and people like that. So. That's that. And I'm grateful for everyone who follows and stuff, because, again, it leads, you know, if it leaves, if it leads 10 percent of the people on Instagram to to listen to the podcast, then that's great. So, yeah, I wanted to have another uh, I have another question for you, but real quick, you mentioned that episode with the trap drummer. And I just have to say that is that the first episode, the history of trap drummers? Yes. That's like my favorite episode. Yeah, Um, that one. And the guy who did. uh man, like the world music, he talked about just all sorts of like kind of an intro to the different time signatures and stuff from Morocco oh, yeah. to Colin, uh, you know, Donahoe, what I'm yeah, it was the, uh, yeah, the world music one. I got to look up the actual name of it, but, uh, he was awesome. The world maestro was his. Yeah. Name. But man, that like, uh, that first one though, it just set the tone for me hearing about it. I really learned something I didn't know, which is, you know, I mean, you and I are always riffing about this kind of stuff, but learning about what was it? The, uh, the block that they would hit for like gunshots, oh, yeah, the surefire shot machine movie. or whatever. Yeah. That's like the coolest percussion thing to me ever. Yeah. But so yeah, well like what's some cool stuff you've learned? What are some of your favorite takeaways? Oh, man. Um, well I would think just everything drum related that I've learned has been great. Uh, I still in no way do I feel like I'm an expert on any of it. Cause again, I always say to people listening to the show or whatever, like we're really learning together. Cause I, you know, but I, you know, it's kind of cool though. Cause like someone will talk to you and say, uh, you know, Oh, what's this? Who's this person? And something just kind of like, it just kind of comes out of you of like, Oh wait, I do know a fair amount of this from doing a right. hundred episodes, but, um, I don't know. I've done a lot of them. I would say one of them that's just kind of like a fun one that comes to mind. That was really cool to, to learn about was like the history of rhythm in animals. Um, Oh, that was cool. Yeah, that was Abby, my wife, as you know, Spencer, but that was Abby's idea. Um, uh, I've just learned also too a lot about like uh, just getting the like the technical stuff of like, okay, you need to be really clear with what you're looking for. Uh, If you ask someone to do an interview, you it's really awkward if you end up changing your mind and wanting to go with someone else. It's almost physically impossible. So be confident in who you're going to ask. Hey, can I interject real quick? Back to that animal one. What what's a real quick like sentence or two summary? Like the rhythm of animals. Uh, so what? that was a really long time ago. That was with Doctor hmm. Ed Large. I just remember feeling like it had uh, a ton of different info, and that's kind of the thing I want to try and keep doing is not just do the history of Ludwig, the history of Rogers, the history of Gretsch, the history of Zildjian, which I love those episodes, but. I want it to be like, uh, you know, there was one about the youngest uh, drummer boy in the Civil War to win a Medal of Honor. And the lady who did it was not a drummer. And um, she did great. And it was a cool, unique episode. Um, so just trying to be unique and different, I think, is is kind of a key thing that I'm trying to uh, do and keep it interesting. Yeah, hmm. same with. Uh, same with uh, social media, I should say. It's like if one night you're posting, uh, you know, Taiko drummers in Japan, then the next night should be a death metal drummer. And then the next night should be um, a drummer in like Mexico. And then the next night should be um, Buddy Rich. You know what I mean? Like it shouldn't be. I do know what you mean. Yeah, it's funny, like for. I mean, people that don't know us, we grew up listening to literally in the car, our CD wallet would be 
Cannibal Corpse. The next one will be Kodo, Taiko drumming. Like, I mean, we've been doing, listening to music from all over the world, percussion heavy music from all over the world for so many years. Yeah. Shout out to Cannibal Corpse. Yeah, there you go. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and uh, things that I've learned too are just that, uh, oh, this is important. So you don't want to say anything. And I think people who listen know that I try to be cognizant of this, of like, if I don't happen to like a certain kind of stick or a symbol mm. or whatever, I should never be like, oh, I can't believe people use those. Those are so bad. Like that genuinely right. hurts someone's feelings and it makes them feel dumb when they use it. When um, And the, the example is when uh, um, someone early on in an episode was talking about using um, those like plastic sticks where you change the tip and they never break. I think they're ahead. Um, I gotta look that up. But uh, in, I think I said, no, man, no one uses those for jazz. And the guy literally emailed me and said, I use those sticks. I play jazz. And I think his words verbatim were like, that actually hurt my feelings when you said that. And I was like, oh my God, sorry. Man, well, I mean, you gotta, it's an interesting, like, I don't know, power is the right word, but you gotta figure like, people listen to you. You know what I mean? It's not that you're an authority figure, but like, it's yeah, it's insulting. People really like listen to you and take what you say seriously and respect your opinion. So that seems like kind of a personal attack. I get yeah, that. And uh, I didn't mean to, obviously. And then it, after that, you learn from those lessons and you go like, you know, if someone's saying, you know, if you have, if whoever's playing live, if a guest says I've cut things out where I go, I don't think that's going to be I don't want, you know, it was never mean, but it would be something like you know, whoever uses this brand of drums, they, you know, I just, I don't get it. I hate those. And I'm like, that doesn't help anything. Yeah, doesn't help anything. Um, and then, uh, one thing that, that I, I even said to this person, I will bring this up, um, in an episode. And I said, I would do it in the hundredth episode. I'll leave his name out of it. But one thing I definitely did learn is, so as people know, there's been, I really like the world war two stuff. I think it's awesome. Just in general, that era is cool of like, you know, everyone since being a little boy, just you, you like the army and stuff like that. But so been a fair amount of episodes that talk about world war two. And then there was even a couple with one with Don Bennett, where we talked about, um, there was a drum that's literally gold drum covered in like 40 gold swastikas. And, um, like made before it was the made war or made in the twenties, I think, oh, um, where in America or where, where was uh, it made? Ludwig made it. So it was made in Chicago, okay. but, you know, uh, I think, but he, I don't, you know, even on that note, let's just, so the, the idea that this person raised to me was, um, and he's a Jewish person. And he said to me that, uh, we were talking about it and I believe he said the topic was handled great. He just wanted to let me know that the discussion of like, yeah, taking the power back for the symbol and all this stuff. He said, I want people to know, uh, in verbatim, he's saying, I want you to understand how absolutely powerful of a symbol the swastika is and for other victims of Nazis, regardless uh, what it previously symbolized. So sure. And he goes on and it's very, you know, he said e it's evil, it's terrible. And I, and we all understand that it was a symbol around forever. And in no way is he like saying anything bad about me, but he, he said, I think you should let people know that, when you talk about World War II stuff and Germany, and there was an episode with a gentleman named Fritz, um, where we talked about, you know, European versus your German, or I'm sorry, European versus American drum companies. And we talked about, you know, that German era. And then, and it's just, again, you need to be uh, sensitive to that where, I mean, yeah, obviously that's a terrible thing that happened to those, that entire culture. So it's just like, it's sensitive stuff, man. I mean, it's, uh, I think you handle it well though. It's, uh, yeah, you handle it well. It's delicate stuff. That's very sensitive. And, um, I think you're handling it well. Oh, I appreciate it. And I think hopefully people can understand that you're talking about it purely from the drum point of view. The, the devil himself had a golden fiddle. If there were your show would talk about the fiddle, you know yep. what I mean? Yep. To, um, bring Charlie Daniels band into it. Um, I like to try and involve him as much as I can. <laughs> so, um, anyway, <laughs> Just I, I I told that listener I won't say his name that I would include that just because I think it's pretty serious stuff. But um, yes, on a lighter note though, so maybe here I can uh, you know address because people send in episodes and I think it's worth it's. I mean I'm telling you like 
It's awesome. People send in, I probably get at least one episode. I don't want to say every day, but I would say roughly I get an episode suggested from someone pretty much every day. And I frequently suggest episodes well, and hey, hell you've, you've done a, one or two of them and you post some stuff, which is cool. And then many times you've mocked me and degraded me. <laughs> yeah, I just ignored you. Uh, yeah. I write them down though, when people suggest them, cause I mean, seriously, like someone will say something, I'll go, man, that's a great idea. The history of let's say acrylic drums, which did happen, uh, which the guy who, uh, suggested this episode, who's become a good friend of the show, Mark Fullerton, he, he suggested that he actually connected me with, um, uh, Jim D regattas who did the episode, but, but like, let's say he said the history of acrylic drums. And I went, that's awesome. Yeah, great. And I didn't write it down. Five minutes later, I would completely forget and I would never remember it ever. And I I guarantee, and I should apologize, there's probably earlier on a handful of people, a couple handfuls of people who where I have forgotten this suggestion. But but after, you know, uh, since the last year plus, I've written them all down. Um, These things take a long time to get together and to do uh the production and the scheduling and then someone cancels and they re set it up and then like i've been saying for a while like we're gonna do the history of fives we're gonna do this we've been i just go back and forth with people and uh or noble and cooley that took a year and a half and it finally happened and then it's out you know it's done but they take a long time right one last thing that I want to mention, actually, because um, we're probably getting close to the end here. Um, so Mark, who suggested this episode, was like, what is up with the wacky spelling of your last name? <laughs> I'm Mark. You, you have no idea, dude. So and I mean, Spencer, you obviously can speak um, to this, but uh, the way our name is spelled with a, it's Dutch, a Dutch last name is a little V A N space, little D E R space, big Z E E. And it, our dad and our uncle have been very into like genealogy and our last name has like, to be honest, changed the way it's spelled like throughout our lives. But it's been like this for a while because this is the traditional, you know, if you look at other people with the last name, cause there's a lot of people with the last name Vander and like, Holland and stuff. Um, yeah, it's Dutch. That's how, that's how they that's spell how they it spell over there. There's, they're called, uh, they're Wandersay. There are lots of Wandersays in <laughs> yeah. Holland. So that's why, and it's from the sea in Dutch or of the sea or whatever. You know, I've actually never been to Holland. Oh. We don't speak Dutch, but it's kind of like how, you know, someone with a German last name doesn't mean they're like, you know, eating schnitzel all the time and are actually from Germany. It's just your last name. Um, I met Dutch people though. And I asked them about the spelling. Cause I was like, my mom demands it's a big V and like a regular name. And they were like, tell your mom, she is wrong. You are Wanda say. <laughs> and then the guy clicked his clogs together and ran away. <laughs> he clogged out of the room. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's that Mark. And it's funny cause he said, what's up with the crazy and he did big C little R big a little Z big Y spelling. So that was funny, Mark. Take it easy. Mark. It's not that crazy. <laughs> yeah. So uh, now that you've been doing it for a little bit, what do you see as the future of the podcast? Any cool guests coming up or interesting social media stuff we can expect? Uh, well, so it is um, it's always evolving. I want to be like consistent, but always kind of moving forward. But I don't want to change things how like, you know, your favorite TV show, your favorite TV show now has like a new intro or the music changes. And you're like, oh, I don't like that. Um, so want to be consistent uh there's always cool stuff coming up um i'm interviewing actually tomorrow which when this comes out will be like four days ago uh which is confusing but uh rami from uh a and f drums so we're gonna do a history of a and f which this one's another one that's been i would say easily a year in the making um and that's a newer company so maybe dipping into newer companies um Oh, this is cool. That's so cool. I, I just did one in, 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 it won't be out yet. It'll be out, uh, in, you know, again, go, when you do these interviews, like time gets weird. Cause it's going to be a month from now, but if you're listening in a year, it's 11 months earlier. But so I just did one, um, with Rob Hart about 
uh, Tony Williams, the great Tony Williams. But what he did is he took a clinic recording and he chopped it up and he took lessons with Tony Williams, who played with Miles Davis and a bunch of people for, you know, and right. he chopped up the clinic and we listened to excerpts of Tony Williams talking at a clinic in like uh, Belgium or something. And then we kind of dissected the clips and Tony's lessons. So you're actually hearing the voice of this amazing drummer and teacher. And, uh, man, that's, yeah, I want to do more of that. I think people are going to really like that when it comes out. Um, that's a great idea, man. Cause there's so many, like, um, well, not so many, they're kind of hard to find, but if you can find like recordings where you catch, you know, the engineering, like, okay, can you hear me louder in the booth? If you get like stuff like that of drummers and stuff, that would be fascinating. And I'm going to be totally honest. And there's probably other people who are like me. I don't really want to listen to a three hour clinic. I want someone who was a student of that person. uh, If not, you know, just someone who knew them to dissect key parts and break it down. I think that's a digestible version. Uh, I mean, I obviously the three hour clinic is great, but it's cool to have someone kind of like walk you through it a little bit. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's your podcast is nice because um, you don't have to be a heavy duty drummer percussionist to appreciate the stuff you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's it's meant for Joe, every man and Jane, every woman. Um, and but I, I think it's cool that there's there's uh, I've been really fortunate where there's some really big drummers who I've heard uh, where it's like, oh, they listen to the show. Someone will tell me like uh, they're like, I don't even want to name them because I don't want to make them feel weird and stop listening because I love it. But very famous drummers. Yeah. Oh, I've seen a few likes where I'm like, oh man. Yeah. I will say Instagram wise, yeah. Brad Wilk from rage against the machine. When he started following and liking things, that was like a childhood, like, oh my God. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Evil empire is the first CD I ever bought in for fourth grade. So when you told me that I was like, man, when do we meet yeah. Brad? <laughs> we need to convert him to an Insta or a uh, podcast listener, but that's, that's the next step. Yeah. Brad, if you listen. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that's it. And uh, oh, one thing, too, that there's you've probably noticed on the show, people listening, that there's now some sponsorships that are coming in more like Dream Symbols has been on uh, the last you know couple episodes. And um, it's just been really cool. Uh, there's never been part of me at, at first was like, I need to explain this to people and, you know, I have to get sponsorship. But like then I was like, no, everyone realizes like I do this all the time i need to literally be able to like justify the amount of time that i put into this with getting money from yeah. drum companies who want to tell you guys about their cool products so hopefully they get more sponsors you know and make it even more sustainable yeah absolutely more power to yeah. you sell out to the man yeah. you know i'm just kidding no it, I mean, you have to do it it's all drum companies and stuff keep it going yeah, for now we'll see if uh, zip recruiter wants to sponsor i mean really who cares every podcast has ads and stuff so just you know that that is true so um yeah that's pretty much it i'm going to the chicago drum show um i'll be there on sunday i have to work saturday doing a vocal session and i forgot to put it on the calendar so i got scheduled so i'm completely missing half of the drum show but um by the time this is out it'll be over and i'll be you know posting about it on social media and stuff and uh anywho that's about it for me but uh so spencer you are an artist why don't you tell people about like you know what you're doing and your website and stuff thank you bart it's been very fun doing this dude i've been listening since you started this it's been awesome to watch you grow with it um, my name is Spencer Vanderzee, as Bart said. I drew Tom the Drum, oh, yeah. his logo. Uh, and I am a muralist and artist. If you want to check out my stuff, really, probably the best way is just check me out on Instagram. It's at Spencer Vanderzee, just like Bart spells it, which is weird in Dutch. <laughs> um, otherwise, yeah, check me out online. And uh, Bart, thanks again, dude. I'm very proud of you, and your, your podcast is amazing. I look forward to what you're going to do in the future. Yeah, and I heard minimal tent flapping. Um... That's good. That's good. And I've been sucking down margaritas during this, so I hopefully I'm not slurring. <laughs> no, no, that's great. Um, so you're at the Grand Canyon. Um, when we live 15 minutes from each other, and we could have done this in person, but that's just how we roll. Yeah, I'm in a town. Yeah, I'm in a town. <laughs> All right. Well, Spencer, thanks for being here. Um, there's no Patreon bonus episode this week because this is it. Um, it's going to be, you know, I think we've We've literally run out of things to talk about. Um, so, yeah, thanks for everyone who has supported the show and listened for the last hundred episodes. I love when you guys and girls send me messages and say, like, I've literally gone through every episode start to finish. Uh, I love when people say, hey, I listen on my route 
as a FedEx driver. I listen out in my backyard at night with a beer by the fire. Um, I'm a long haul truck driver and I listen on the road. Um, these are just some examples. Um, it's just awesome. I mean, I think I listen to podcasts like all day. I've been painting a bedroom at my house and it's like, of course I listen to like six hours of podcasts. So it's just cool to think people living their lives, uh, with the show kind of running in the background. It's crazy, man. And people feel like they know you, you know, I was a delivery guy for a long time as my, my gig. And, uh, yeah, I listen to podcasts and you get to like know the host. So it's pretty cool that, that people know you, I think they really like you and they, they trust you as an authority on some stuff. So good job, dude. Cool. Well, thanks. I hope, uh, I live up to those expectations. So, uh, all right. On that note, well, thank you for being here, Spencer, and I'll let you get back to your margarita in your tent and, um, say hey to the family for me and we'll see you when you get back in town. All right. See you guys. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.